Hey there. Today, we're diving into one of the most important equations in all of physics, the Schrodinger equation. It's the cornerstone of quantum mechanics and helps us understand the strange world of atoms and subatomic particles. It might look a bit intimidating at first, but by the end of this video, we'll have a clear grasp of what it means and how to use it. Our main goals are to understand its fundamental concepts, differentiate between its two forms, and see it in action. So, by the end of our chat, you will be able to distinguish between the time-dependent and time-independent forms of the Schrodinger equation. Define key terms like the wave function and the Hamiltonian operator, and solve it for some simple but important systems. Let's get started. Before we jump into the equation itself, let's set the stage. In the quantum world, particles don't behave like tiny billiard balls. Instead, they exhibit wave-like properties. This idea, called wave-particle duality, tells us that things like electrons can be described both as particles and as waves. It's a pretty mind-bending concept. So how do we describe these quantum waves mathematically? We use something called a wave function. The wave function, denoted by the Greek letter psi piece, is the central object in quantum mechanics. It contains all the information we can possibly know about a particle. It's a complex valued function that depends on the particle's position, r, and time, t. So what does it actually tell us? It's not the particle itself. Instead, the square of the absolute value of the wave function gives us a probability density. That's right, the probability density. If we take the absolute value of pi and square it, we get a function that, when integrated over a region, tells us the probability of finding the particle in that region. In simpler terms, it defines a probability cloud showing where the particle is most likely to be found. Because the particle has to be found somewhere, the probability of finding it over all possible space must add up to 1 or 100. This is the normalization condition. To recap, the wave function P is a mathematical function that describes a quantum particle, and its magnitude squared tells us the probability of finding the particle at a certain location. Now that we know about wave functions, how do we find them? That's where the Schrodinger equation comes in. Just like Newton's laws govern how particles move in classical mechanics, the Schrodinger equation dictates how wave functions evolve. It looks like this. We read this as i bar times the partial derivative of psi with respect to t equals h hat times pcci. Let's break it down. This is the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, or TDSE, because it includes time, t. Let's look at the terms. First, we have i, which is the imaginary unit, i equals the square root of negative 1. Then we have h bar, which is Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. It's a fundamental constant that defines the scale of quantum effects. The left side of the equation tells us about the wave function's evolution in time. The right side introduces a new concept, the Hamiltonian operator. The Hamiltonian, h hat, is an operator. In quantum mechanics, operators are like mathematical instructions for what to do with the wave function. The Hamiltonian specifically corresponds to the total energy of the system, the sum of kinetic and potential energy. So the TDSE is essentially a statement of energy conservation for a quantum particle. The rate of change of the wave function in time is proportional to the total energy of the system. In essence, this equation describes how a particle's probability cloud spreads out, moves, or changes shape over time. While the time-dependent equation is the full picture, for many problems, the potential energy of a particle doesn't change with time. When that's the case, we can simplify things greatly. We can assume the potential energy V is only a function of position, not time. This is a very common scenario in atomic and molecular physics. When the potential is time-independent, the wave function can be written as a product of two functions, one that depends only on position, and one that depends only on time. We call the position-dependent part the stationary wave function, ci of r, and the time-dependent part, t of t. This is called the method of separation of variables. Plugging this separated form into the time-dependent equation and doing a bit of algebra leads us to the time-independent Schrodinger equation, or TIES. This equation is much easier to work with. Notice what it says. Applying the Hamiltonian operator to the position-dependent wave function psi gives us the same wave function psi back again, just multiplied by a constant E. This constant E is the energy of the system. The time-independent Schrodinger equation is an eigenvalue equation. 
The wave functions P are called the eigenfunctions, and the corresponding energies E are called the eigenvalues. This equation is central to understanding energy quantization, the idea that particles can only have discrete energy levels. We find these by solving the TIS. Okay, let's see this in action. Our first example will be the simplest possible one, a free particle. A free particle is one that experiences no forces. This means its potential energy is constant everywhere. For simplicity, we can set that constant to zero. We'll solve the one-dimensional time-independent Schrodinger equation for a free particle. The Hamiltonian for a single particle in 1D is h hat equals negative h bar squared over 2 menard times the second derivative with respect to x plus the potential v of x. The first part is the kinetic energy operator, and the second is the potential energy. Since v of x is zero for a free particle, our Hamiltonian is just the kinetic energy term. Now we substitute this into the TIS h hat p psi equals e p psi. This gives us a second order linear differential equation to solve. We can rearrange this slightly, and the general solution to an equation of this form psi double prime equals a constant times p psi, is a sum of two exponential functions. Here, a and b are constants we determine from boundary conditions, and k is what we call the wave number. This value k is directly related to the energy E. This solution describes a superposition or combination of two plane waves traveling in opposite directions. The energy E can be any positive value. It's continuous, just like in classical mechanics. Our next and more interesting example is the one-dimensional infinite potential well, or particle in a box. This model is incredibly useful because it's a simplification of what happens to an electron confined in a small region, like an atom or a quantum dot. Imagine a particle free to move along the x-axis, but only between x i zero and x i l. Everywhere else, from negative infinity to zero, and from l to infinity, the potential energy is infinite. This infinite potential acts like brick walls, preventing the particle from ever leaving the box. Since the potential is zero inside the box, the TIC there is the same as for the free particle. So the general solution inside the box is also the same. Psi of x equals a times e to the ikx plus b times e to the negative ikx. But now we have a crucial condition, boundary conditions. Because the walls are infinitely high, there is a zero probability of finding the particle there. This means the wave function must be zero at the edges of the box. So we must have psi of zero equals zero and psi of L equals zero. These are the boundary conditions that will determine the specific solutions. Let's apply them. For the first condition, psi of zero equals zero. Plugging in X and zero, we get A plus B equals zero. This means B must be equal to negative A. So B ekash A. This simplifies our general solution inside the box. It becomes a times the quantity e to the ikx minus e to the negative ikx. Using Euler's formula, this is just 2ia times sine of kx. We can absorb the constants into a new constant c to get a cleaner expression. So our wave function inside the box must be of the form c times sine of kx. Now for the second boundary condition, psi of l equals zero. Plugging in xl, we find that the sine of kl must be zero. For the sine of an angle to be zero, the angle must be an integer multiple of pi. This gives us our quantization condition. KL must equal n pi, where n is a positive integer. We'll soon see what this means for the particle's energy. Let's continue from where we left off. Our boundary conditions for the particle in a box led to the requirement that k times l equals n times pi, where n is a positive integer. This gives us a formula for the allowed wave numbers, k equals n pi over l. Notice that k is now quantized. It can only take on specific discrete values. Now remember that the energy E is related to the wave number k. By plugging our quantized wave number, k back into the energy formula, we get the energy levels of the particle. And here it is. The energy levels E n are quantized. The particle cannot have any arbitrary energy. It must be one of these discrete values. This is a profound result of quantum mechanics. Unlike a classical particle in a box that could have any energy, our quantum particle is restricted to an energy ladder. The lowest possible energy level is for n plus one, and it's not zero. This is called the zero-point energy, 
and it means the particle can never be perfectly still. It's a consequence of the uncertainty principle. Let's also look at the wave functions themselves. Since k is quantized to k a tin, our wave function is also quantized. We normalize it, which we won't do here, to find the constant c. Here's what the first three energy levels and their corresponding probability densities look like. For n number 1, the probability is highest in the middle of the box. For n number 2, there's a node in the middle and two peaks. As n increases, so does the energy, the number of nodes, and the number of peaks. This beautifully illustrates energy quantization. Let's work through a concrete numerical example. This will help solidify the concept of quantized energy levels. Imagine an electron confined in a one-dimensional box that is 10 nanometers long. We want to calculate the energies of its first three quantum states. First, let's list our known values. The mass of an electron is approximately 9.1 in times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms, and Planck's constant is about 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. The length of the box is 10 nanometers, which is 10 times 10 to the negative 9 meters. Our goal is to use the energy formula to find E1, E2, and E3. First, let's calculate the lowest energy level, E21, for which n equals 1. We plug in all the numbers. Be careful with the squaring and the exponents. After doing the math, we find that E1 is approximately 5.48 times 10 to the negative 22 joules. This is a very small amount of energy, typical for the quantum scale. Actually, let's recalculate this to avoid a mistake. It seems I made an arithmetic error. Let's reevaluate E1. Okay, squaring 10 to the negative 9 gives 10 to the negative 18. So the denominator is 8 times 9.11 times 10 to the negative 49. The correct result for E1 is approximately 6.03 times 10 to the negative 24 joules. Next, let's find E2 for n equals 2. The formula tells us that En is proportional to n squared. This means E2 is 2 squared, or 4, times E1. So we multiply our value for E1 by 4 to get about 2.41 times 10 to the negative 23 joules. Finally, for E3, we set n equal to 3. E3 will be 3 squared, or 9, times e to 1. Multiplying e1 by 9 gives us approximately 5.43 times 10 to the negative 23 joules. This example shows that the energy levels are not equally spaced. Instead, the spacing increases as the energy gets higher. Let's put your understanding to the test with a practice problem. Feel free to pause the video and try to work through this yourself. Suppose an electron is in a one-dimensional box. Its wave function is described by psi of x equals a times sine of 3 pi x over l. First, what is the quantum number n for this state? Second, what is the energy of this state in terms of n, h bar, m, and l? And third, is this the lowest possible energy state for the electron? Take a moment to think about it. All right, let's go over the solution. For the first part, we compare the given wave function to our general solution for the particle in a box. The general solution is p psi n of x equals a constant time sine of n pi x over l. Comparing this to our given wave function, p psi of x equals a times sine of 3 pi x over l, we can see that the quantum number n must be 3. Now for the second part, the energy of this state. We just use our energy quantization formula. E n equals n squared h bar squared pi squared over 2 mgale squared and substitute n equals 3. This gives us 9 times h bar squared pi squared over 2 mnl squared. Finally, is this the lowest possible energy state? Remember the lowest energy state is the ground state, which corresponds to the lowest allowed quantum number, n equals 1. Since our state has n equals 3, its energy e to 3 is higher than the ground state energy e to 1. So no, this is not the lowest energy state. Let's quickly recap what we've covered today. We started by understanding the central role of the wave function, p psi, in quantum mechanics. We then introduced the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, which describes how wave functions evolve in time. We learned that the Hamiltonian operator h hat represents the total energy of the system, kinetic plus potential. We then saw that for time-independent potentials, we can use the much simpler time-independent Schrodinger equation, or TIES. 
This equation is an eigenvalue equation where the eigenfunctions p psi are the stationary states and the eigenvalues E are their corresponding energies. We applied the TISE to the particle in a box and, by using boundary conditions, we derived the formula for the quantized energy levels. This showed us that the particle can only exist in discrete energy states. We have successfully distinguished between the time-dependent and time-independent forms of the Schrodinger equation, defined the wave function and Hamiltonian, and solved a key quantum mechanical problem. You're now well on your way to exploring the quantum world. This lesson was part of a larger series designed to make advanced physics concepts accessible. If you're interested in learning more, here are a few suggestions. First, explore the time-dependent Schrodinger equation in more detail. This will allow you to study particle dynamics, like how a wave packet moves over time. Second, investigate the infinite potential well in three dimensions to see how the energy levels become dependent on three quantum numbers. Finally, learn about the finite potential well. This is a more realistic model that allows the particle to tunnel through a barrier, a fascinating and uniquely quantum phenomenon. Understanding these topics will deepen your appreciation for the power and elegance of quantum mechanics. Thank you for joining me, and I hope this explanation has been clear and helpful. Keep exploring the universe.